Is Jason Aldean's new song, Try That in a Small Town, racist? Does it promote violence? And is there a growing divide between big cities and small towns? Let's talk about it, Mama, since I feel like we are uniquely qualified to address this, given that we left a major metropolitan area, Portland, Oregon, which actually had a lot of civil disobedience, if you want to call it that. I refer to them as riots, but that's just me. Okay. Yeah. So I was a city girl through and through. I was born in Seattle and raised in the Seattle area. And so that was my hometown. It was an area we were really proud of that it was really, really a cool city. And now we go back very, very rarely. And it's not an area that I feel safe with, with our kids. Why is that? Uh, It's just not a safe area anymore. And the crime's through the roof. And so we left the Seattle area with one child in tow. We had three more children in basically right outside of Portland. And we moved to Vancouver, Washington, thinking that it would be a smaller city, more, more rural areas and things like that. But really Portland kind of pours into that area. Unfortunately. Yeah. And that happened in the time that we were living there. Right. So, I mean, I'm not here to bash cities. I mean, obviously I was born in the city with the now second highest crime rate in the entire nation. So everyone always thinks about like Chicago and things like that, but Seattle completely trumps. Uh, it's a mess. It, it's an it absolute is. mess. And the same things happen in Southwest Washington and Portland. It's all over the, you know, the news and the media. It, there are, are shootings and stabbings and people that are dying on a very, very consistent basis. Mm-hmm. And in the time that we lived there from 2007 until 2020, that wasn't the case, especially in the very beginning, but we saw it increasing rapidly over those years. Yeah. I mean, when I grew up in Seattle, it was cool. Like when we were teenagers and young adults, even kids, we would go and hang out at Gasworks Park and my parents were okay with that. We were like, we're going to Gasworks Park yep. for, and there, that was never a cool big spot. deal. Very cool spot. I mean, so cool. And there was always music festivals there and everything. And now that is not a safe area. I mean, you can't take your little kids there. And, and people used to go there for the 4th of July and bring their small children and picnic in the park. And now I would be very careful to walk through that grass. I think it's so much worse than people realize. If, you don't, if you're not from that area, if mm-hmm. you haven't actually, actually experienced it firsthand, there are tents, transients everywhere. With that comes open drug use. With that comes uh, violence, a yeah. ton of violence. And back when we were in Southwest Washington State, I was a police officer. I had to deal with Antifa and a lot of what was so commonly referred to as protest yeah. um, or uprisings. Mm-hmm. They were really just riots. Right. Um, we dealt with that firsthand and it was a big motivating factor. And it was a big part of why it is that we left that area and came to an extremely small town. Right. Well, I think it's a big reason that a lot of businesses are fleeing these areas as well. So In droves. Yeah. At Christmas time, Seattle at Christmas time was really cool. And we would go down and we would see the Macy's window display. And that was a that was a thing. We did it with my mom and my yaya and, and we did it every year. We'd go, we would walk to Starbucks, just the girls. And we would wait till it was dark because then all the Christmas lights were on. Mm-hmm. You can't do that anymore. And so my sister actually went at Christmas time last year and she went down to where Macy's was and where all those businesses were that had the big window displays. And it was completely boarded up. All of those businesses were pretty much destroyed during the, um, I guess it was the BLM riots in 2020 that resulted in that, was it six city blocks that turned into Chaz or Chop or whatever they wanted to call it? Whatever it was, it was and, a mess. And so all those windows got bashed out and those businesses never reopened. A lot of the business owners were like, forget it. We're not, we have no protection down here. Um, these riders, many of which were not from Seattle, mm-hmm. they were bussed in mm-hmm. by the hundreds to just cause chaos. Yep. And the businesses just left. And you're seeing that in Portland as well. A lot of these, isn't it REI that's closing up? REI is yeah, closing up shop. And there are a number of uh, larger corporations that are shutting down their stores in the area to go along with these smaller, I guess, more mom and pop brick and mortar businesses that are yeah. there as well. It's, it's it, yeah, it's out of control and has been for a while. Yeah, it has been. And I think it's really sad because, I mean, the whole point of, the, you know, they said they're anti-fascist, anti-capitalist, all this stuff, um, which I obviously do not consider the same thing. And what they really did was ruin the livelihood of a lot of mom and pop businesses Mm -hmm. and put them out of business. And also like these larger corporations, which are huge employers. And so when you lose REI, you lose hundreds of jobs. When you lose Macy's, you lose hundreds of jobs. So 
it's it ma- it's just really unfortunate for the community because it makes it hard to survive out there as a law abiding bill paying property owner. So I want to revisit and come back to this word community and the Mm -hmm. the buzzword because this is flung around so readily in these bigger cities. But I want to tie all of this this discussion back into the more recent news of Jason Aldean specifically in his song, Try That in a Small Town, where in the recently released music video, there are depictions and just clips that are taken of robberies that are occurring, um, the same riots that are happening in these larger cities and the subsequent controversy that is coming along with the release of that music video. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's not even depictions, really. It's these are actual all of the footage used in Jason Aldean's music video was actual news footage. Mm -hmm. So these were stories from the news and everyone's calling it racist. But when I was watching it, I've watched it multiple times. And as I'm watching it, I'm looking at the protesters that are being or um, thieves or whatever have, you know, there was a convenience store being robbed. Robbers. And Mm -hmm. rather than protesters, how about rioters? Because I I hate that the reality of these situations are always masked with these gentler versions of, you know, they use words like protesters for rioters, or they refer to a riot as an uprising. It drives me insane (laughs) because that's not what it is. You're trying to soften the blow and you're trying to make it sound Like it's not as big of a deal as it is. Right. This is, yeah, these are not peaceful protests. These are people um, burning, looting. And so oftentimes the people involved are not of a minority class. That was what I was just going to say. In the video, I, it was, it was a white woman spitting in the the face of a police officer that was just standing there. Been there, done that. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, It was. Oh, it was two white people that walk into a convenience store and get knocked out by like the trucker or whatever that was standing there. I love that clip. And <laughs> were they two white males? And I thought those were actually actual minorities. But it's oh, besides I don't know. the they point. They had masks on. They looked they looked white to me. But it, anyway, it's beside the point. Yeah. So I guess what kind of what kind of struck me as odd was saying if you are opposed to this criminal activity because that's what it is. It's criminal activity. It's not evil. only that they're they're claiming that he is promoting violence yes and criminal activity when it all the examples that are used within the music video are examples of people who are having to resort to actual I can find the physical aggression to combat the aggression that is is being used against them and i'm not promoting violence mm-hmm. whatsoever nor would i ever at the same time if you are defending yourself if you are a police officer if you are a private citizen you are fully within your rights to defend yourself by using physical force. I think it's completely appropriate. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just looking up the lyrics here because I listened to the lyrics and I just couldn't find anything that I, Black Lives Matter is not mentioned. Um, not once. There's actually no gun violence mentioned either. Nope. The only time that anything like that is even mentioned is when he said that he got a hand-me-down from his grandpa that he just... Um, right that he just treasured and he didn't want to lose that item. Of a pew pew. He didn't want that taken from him. Yes. So, all right, lyrics. So while you're trying to find the lyrics to the the song, um, I I just, I think the actual message that is trying to be made, the actual point that's trying to be made within the song is that the things that are tolerated nowadays in these large cities are not tolerated within these small towns. And there are numerous examples of that, including some here locally, right? Right. Okay, I found the lyrics. Go ahead. All right, so it's sucker punch someone on a sidewalk, carjack an old lady at a red light. <gasps> These are all ag- aggressive acts being committed by, yes. by by the adversaries, not by the people that right. he's referring to within these small towns. Pull a pew pew on the owner of a liquor store. You think it's cool? Well, act a fool if you like. Cuss out a cop, spit in his face, stomp on the flag and light it up. Yeah, you think you're tough. Well, try that in a small town and see how far you make it down the road. Because okay. small towns will not tolerate it. Right. So we experienced that as well. So we came here in 2020. We were basically fleeing what was happening to the cities. You were a police officer out there. I was fed up with it. Absolutely fed up with it. Yeah. And to me, it was really scary to have you in that line of work with the the narrative around police officers at the time because mm-hmm. we were seeing stories of officers um murdered in their cars sitting in their cars Mm -hmm. and it just was terrifying to think this is how people were believing that they were pushing their agenda they were acting righteously yes in the eyes of many 
right and they were being celebrated for this and people were like so who cares it's a right. pig mm -hmm. and so i would read these news articles and there was a lot of make pigs fly and things like that even um said towards you and so on a very consistent basis yes yeah and then you were at one of the protests where somebody sprayed silly string on you and tried to light it and i thought okay someone tried to light my husband on fire and that 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 is what it is but the fact that there was this narrative to go hand in hand mm -hmm. with kind of like everything we spoke about last week in the pedophilia world and how people are trying to go out of their way and bend over backwards to formulate an argument that justifies those actions it, it goes hand in hand with essentially the same group of people saying that hey um, you're you're perfectly justified in using violence against a certain group of people especially if you're a minority you are perfectly justified in burning down these cities you are perfectly justified in victimizing random people i could go on and on and and the fact that there was very there were very few people willing to speak up against that narrative was incredibly frustrating and it's why i'm saying i got so fed up with it and there's a big part of why it is that we left that profession and left mm -hmm. the area yeah you were not able to safely do your job not you just you just weren't you, there are a lot of examples of, of occasions and incidents where you were literally told to to stand down and allow for criminal activity to happen right in your very presence because it was all situational and uh there was this strategy of trying to de-escalate which basically meant do nothing mm -hmm. yeah and so that was scary for me because as your wife and you were the father of our four children the thought of something happening to you because somebody was angry about an unrelated case it just wasn't worth the risk anymore so i think that the cities are losing a lot of really good cops they're losing cops that got in it for the right reason that are not racist that are not violent that are just literally are family men and they're walking away because it's not worth the risk and they are no longer allowed to do the job that they signed, signed up, up to for. do absolutely yeah so so i think that's where we're losing control in the cities it's what has made my hometown completely fall apart seattle is destroyed in my opinion my home is not my home anymore i don't even want to go there i think it's a very unsafe area so there was a great documentary uh film essentially i think mm -hmm. it's like an hour and a half long that was put out by eric johnson who is a part of uh, como which is i think the abc news affiliate in seattle washington and the documentary is titled seattle is dying and it mm -hmm. very it, it does a great job of documenting the realities of uh, exactly what's happening in seattle in particular but it's applicable to so many mm -hmm. major metropolitan areas yeah. across our country la is a big one la san francisco portland take your pick yeah i mean now the, now what you're seeing is the legalization of drugs and or at least not and they're not calling it the legalization they're calling it the decriminalization of drugs well that's the same thing and they're like well you're allowed to have what is it three grams four grams i don't know because i left before that uh took effect but basically i think it was the supreme court in washington state at the very least said that hey it's a free-for-all now right it, it, and i know a lot of prosecutors um are declining to actually file charges against mm -hmm. folks or I, I think just basically simple minor possession of any yeah. user narcotic. amount as long as it's yeah. not a dealer amount you don't have a bunch of small little packages that you're right. dealing out if you have a user's amount now it is decriminalized and i believe the same uh policy has been enacted in the state of oregon as well when that came through a vote believe yeah. it or not yeah which is just absolutely insane you're that's not compassion you're not helping these people uh drugs is i mean if you look if you walk through la when we took our kids through la and we saw a lot of open drug use when we were there. A ton of it. And our kids were scared because they didn't they don't know that here. They don't see that here. And yep. so when they saw that it was it was very alarming and when I think I think it was Kira was like why is everyone just walking around like it's okay? Like this lady was eating out of a garbage can. She had track marks all over and then she kind of collapsed to the ground and started shooting a needle in the top of her yeah, foot. It's, it's very sad, it really is. And, and the fact that people treat uh, this enabling type of behavior and they, they refer to it as being compassionate, I mm -hmm. completely 100% disagree. There is no compassion mm -mm. that is being given to these people. These people need right. intervention. These people need help. These people need assistance. And to allow for them to just continue on with the behavior that is destroying their life and the life very oftentimes of their families it's not okay right and you're seeing the problem grow bigger and bigger and bigger with the more lax regulations mm -hmm. so these cities didn't used to look like this and so to say oh this is just how these people are it's like no these are addicts and they need help yes. but 
some, you know, cities like Seattle and LA are spending up to a billion dollars annually on these prevention programs, outreach programs, but yet all they're doing is enabling and making these people sicker and sicker and sicker. Let's allow for you to continue living on the street. Let's mm-hmm. allow for you to live in these absolutely... Continue using. Continue using. Not only continue using, but we'll provide you with the needles that you need to to continue using. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, yeah, I could go on and on. Right. So as somebody who has drug users in their family, uh, that's not compassion because these are very dark demons and the pull of addiction is very strong and they don't have the power to stop it on their own. The love and, and pull of family isn't enough. And you're referring to your, your um, siblings. I'm referring, a couple of yeah, your siblings, I'm referring yeah. to a couple of my siblings. So, um, you know, I've lost my own brothers to the methamphetamine problems and there is no compassion in enabling them because the only time that they were ever able to get clean is when they did happen to get picked up. Mm-hmm. And By picked up, you mean arrested, arrested and, and put in jail. Put in jail for an extended period of time to where they were forced to get clean. And every time that they did, they had that little bit of hope. Mm-hmm. And granted, inevitably, and inevitably, they would end up falling back into it. But that was the only glimmers of hope that we had. Mm-hmm. And so when you just remove that, like they don't, they don't get arrested anymore. They don't, they don't get booked anymore for using. And now there is no hope. I guess my take is that by enabling these behaviors, you are depriving people of their humanity. You mm-hmm. are no longer treating them like your fellow human being. And to piggyback on what you just said, I can, I can remember, I think on three different occasions where I received handwritten letters from drug, user, drug, drug users that I arrested, booked into jail, mm-hmm. who came back, uh, were put into a program that assisted them with getting clean, with getting their life put back together. And they went out of their way to actually thank me for treating them with respect and dignity, but also assisting them, maybe even unintentionally, through the process of taking them off of the street, booking them into jail, and getting them into these programs. Mm-hmm. I think that is a far better example of genuine compassion yeah, as opposed to what it is that we've been talking about here, just allowing for this behavior to continue. Right. Yeah. The, I just, I don't see the compassion in that at all. And it's definitely making the problem worse. I mean, I think you can look around LA, you can look around Seattle, Portland, Chicago, any New York, anywhere where you're seeing people just lost to the streets and enabled. The problem is becoming worse with the more lax policies. So obviously we have a problem and it's going in the wrong direction. And I don't understand why, why that can't just be addressed and like let's all just be honest Mm -hmm. our cities are falling apart and a lot of the crime that you are talking about a lot of the homelessness even though now they want it to be referred to as houselessness um all of that a lot of it ties back into drug use Mm -hmm. um and so conversely let's talk about why you think it is that this really doesn't exist or exists it exists to a much smaller level within these small towns the violence the criminal behavior that is referred to as protests, all of that. Why do you think it is that here locally and within our small towns here in North Idaho doesn't really seem to be a problem, even though you can drive a few miles across the Washington state border in Spokane and find it all over the place? I think a lot of it is the enabling programs in a way, like there's no resources in some of these small towns. And so people don't rely on them. You're not going to be able to go somewhere in North Idaho in a small town and get clean needles and get methadone. And it's just, that's not going to happen. You're going to get, you're going to get arrested if you get caught with drugs. I completely agree with you. Um, and there's a great example of it. If you go just between the cities of Coeur d'Alene and the city of Spokane, you drive through Spokane, you see all Mm -hmm. of the open drug use, you see all of the homelessness, you see the violence, you see the protests, you take a 15 or 20 minute drive eastward across the Idaho border into Coeur d'Alene. You see none of those things Mm -hmm. because number one, it's not tolerated. Honestly, I think it's because primarily because it isn't tolerated. And a good example of that is when we had all of these protesters threatening to actually come over to Coeur d'Alene to quote unquote protest. And, and they were met with uh, locals here who showed up, mm-hmm. did not intervene, but made their presence known. Many of them were armed and they, they made it very, very clear. While we fully support your right to peacefully assemble and protest here, we will not tolerate any violence toward private citizens, toward businesses. This is our city and you will not come here and destroy it. Well, I think that was very telling because they, once again, bust in these, they were calling them BLM protesters. They were were coming in vans and box trucks. I think 90% of them were actually Caucasian. 
and just your typical it's irrelevant Antifa. no well, i'm just saying but like, the, the narrative that gets pushed that's the is, narrative right. right this is racist because these people aren't allowed to protest and yep. it's like well most of them are actually caucasians just and a lot of them when they started interviewing them and asking them about what they were doing what particular cases and stuff a lot of these really young people 19 20 year olds were like i don't know mm-hmm. they were just there because they thought it was fun mm-hmm. and yeah, it's it an opportunity for uh to, to go crazy mm-hmm. exactly we get to go break things yeah. and, and run around with zero accountability right nothing and, and take on that mob mentality mm-hmm. they were destroying cars and i mean smashing windshields lighting cars on fire so when they were busing them into to north idaho it was sandpoint and coeur d'alene the community it was Sandpoint, right? Too? I don't know about Sandpoint. Oh. I, th- I know for a fact that, yeah, folks were coming over into Coeur d'Alene. Okay, so they lined the streets, all the people, and they were mostly protecting their own shops. I know a lot of the sons showed up to protect mom's gift shop and things like that. And so, th- like you said, they said, you have the right to come here and protest, but you cannot break anything. You cannot hurt anyone. You cannot burn cars. And we're going to stand here and we're going to make sure that you don't. And mm-hmm. when the buses rolled in and they saw that, they didn't want to peacefully protest. They backed up and they left. Yeah, because so, it, they weren't being provided with the opportunity. Whereas yeah. in these big cities, you have literally areas that are are cordoned off and set aside for such behavior. Mm-hmm. Or when such behavior ensues, nothing is being done about it. Yeah, and I know a few people did stay and there was a small little protest where they walked down the streets. But it was so uneventful. It was nothing like what they were used to. Yeah. And they didn't stay long. They were like, this is boring. And they left. Protest all you want. Like I said, fully support your right to protest. Uh, you, you want to light an American flag on fire? So be it. I disagree with the act, but I understand that you have the right to do it. You better understand that you're probably going to be punched in the face if you go to a exactly small town and do that. Correct. Exactly correct. Which is what the song by Jason Aldean right. was referring to. This yeah. is the difference between small towns and big cities. Yeah. People have a lot of community pride in a small town because they were born and raised here. There's one high school and, you know, people... 30 years later, still wear the school colors. Mm -hmm. When you go to a football game here, it's everybody in the town town. goes. Yeah. And again, so I said we were going to revisit that, that buzzword that gets flung around so oftentimes in big cities of community Mm -hmm. and folks who think that there is a sense of community within these large metropolitan areas. I would say that, sure, it maybe exists, but to a far, far lesser extent than, than there is here in small towns like ours. You don't know people in the big city. When you get millions of people in an area or hundreds of thousands of people in an area, there are so many people you don't recognize them. There's so many people moving in and out. So the sense of community is different. And they have like these community outreach programs and stuff, but they're programs. They're so often politicized and it's not real community. It's not people. A lot of it's done through tax dollars and things like that. And no one even knows where their tax dollars are going or it's programs they don't agree with. So in a small town, if, I mean, we experienced it last year where, you know, if someone's house burns down, the mm-hmm. whole town rallies around that person. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, here's dishes, here's clothes, here's food, here's vouchers, here's whatever you need. What do you need? And then they would put out a community post. And this is what we're looking for. And I have a couch, I have a coffee table. Yep. And that's true community where the actual community at their own free will comes together and helps people. Take it at the smallest level. Let's say that there is a car that's broken down on the side of the road here. What happens? Everyone that passes you asks if you need help. Everybody stops, checks in on you, like wants to know if you're okay, Mm -hmm. what it is that they can do to assist you. Whereas let's say you're broke down on the side of I-5, you're in the shoulder with an overheating car in Portland or in Seattle. You might grab people's attention, but it's it's pretty rare Mm -hmm. that a single person of the thousands driving by would stop to check in on you and ask you what it is that they can do to help you out. Yeah. And some of that is lack of community. Some of that is fear-based because... I think it's a total lack of community because that's what you get when you have bigger groups of people. Mm -hmm. So if you have a small area that has two, three million people in it, there is a lack of individual accountability because everyone wants to pass the buck and say, oh, I'm not going to stop and help because chances are somebody else will. Whereas here in our community, when there's a car that passes by every five minutes or so, if you're lucky, you want to stop and help because you don't know if, you know, somebody else is going to step up to the plate. If you pass by, that person might be stuck there for an additional 20, mm-hmm. 30 minutes. Right. And, 
And a lot of times you'll recognize that person too. You'll be mm-hmm. like, oh, that's Joe. Hey, Joe, do you, need a, <laughs> do fact, you need a hand? A great backstory. When we first came out here, do you remember that we were just in awe of the natural raw beauty? So we, we actually pulled over on the side of the roadway and started taking photographs. Yeah. And literally within the first five minutes, we had we had two or three cars that mm-hmm. stopped and were like, hey, are you folks okay? Are you guys lost? Is there something we can help you out with? Is there something you're trying to find mm-hmm. out here? You can guys... we show you your way out? <laughs> no, it wasn't <laughs> that. Joking, it was, it was genuine concern. Um, I know you're joking, but yeah. it was genuine concern. Right. Um, and hey what can we do to help you out Mm -hmm. is everything okay and when we moved here people wanted to know where were we from what's our story and uh, what are our names inviting us to their homes for dinner yes we were (laughs) we were definitely invited i mean we've even had dinners put on like come over we're gonna put a dinner on for you and we're gonna introduce you to everyone and so it was really different when i lived or when we lived in a neighborhood with 40 houses in the little circle i knew those neighbors less then mm-hmm. I know people in this town where I live 30 miles from them mm-hmm. because there is a greater sense of community here. Yes. I think so much of that gets lost when you start amplifying numbers, the number of people in a given area. Well, and I think human nature is, um, I think that, well, charitable, like by nature, I think people are. But when you live in a big city and there are all these programs and there are all these other people, you do kind of think, well, oh, there's there's going to be a charity for that or there's something to help these people. And so I don't individually have to do it. Yeah. And when you kind of strip all that away and that expectation for someone else to do it isn't there, then you do see a lot more people step up to the plate. And that's where true charity comes from is just people seeing a problem and addressing it. Yeah, I completely agree. And I can't say that we probably haven't been guilty of it ourselves while we were living in those areas. While we always... Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. We made a number of efforts to try to help as many people as we could, but I guarantee that there were circumstances or situations where our our subconscious thought Mm -hmm. process was that, oh, there's probably somebody else here in the area that's better suited to help this person Mm -hmm. than we are. When that wasn't necessarily the case, and it's that mentality that persists and allows for people to actually slip through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I think that's why a lot of people crave like the church community and stuff too. Because mm-hmm. even in big cities, I think that's why you do see a lot of that those kind of organizations. Because when I mean, when my uncle passed away, her entire ch- church community rallied around her. Your your aunt, yeah, yeah. Yep. And so those small, but it was just that small community that she had within a large city that rallied around her. Right. The the city didn't. Right. But here, if somebody loses their spouse, the whole community rallies around and it's not just their church it's everybody that's here so you see a lot of small town pride and they they do take care of their own which is what's mentioned in that song we take care of our own and they do and even if you move to that town like us we've only been here four years i know that if something were to happen where we needed the community they would absolutely be there step up to the plate for Mm -hmm. sure yeah and it's a beautiful thing i wish it existed everywhere it's just sad to me that there is such a uh wide Seemingly, it's a it's a misunderstanding between people who live in urban areas as opposed to rural areas, right. and it doesn't have to be that way. And but the the fact that there's this narrative that's now pop up this week, we're, we've been seeing it mm-hmm. um, in the media, we've been seeing it online, and we again we just felt like we were uniquely uh, situated to speak on this because of our very recent personal history with leaving the city of Portland and all the chaos that exists there in my line of work, and then coming here to an area that our entire county I think has less than 15,000 people. So it's a very right. close knit community and there is a difference that comes with that. And I saw zero issue with the song, the lyrics, the concept, the premise of the song was was completely spot on in my opinion. Right, so I don't think that it incites violence at all or encourages violence. It's saying if you come here with violence, you will be stopped. You will be met with I mean, force, potentially but, the same type yeah, of violence, but that's not, no. that's not instigating the violence, that's right. responding to violence. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, Despite what a lot of people uh, like to to say or think, speaking from 13 years in law enforcement, oftentimes the only way to overcome violence is with force, actual force of your own. Unfortunately, you can't plead with somebody who's in the process of actively hurting, injuring, or you know, trying to to kill somebody else. Right. That's that's not a time for talk. That's a time for intervention, mm-hmm. physical intervention. Yeah, I I don't think that I. I absolutely believe in the right to free speech, the right to assemble, hundred percent, all of those things, but you do not have the right to injure somebody else. You do not have the right to ruin somebody's business. You do not have the right to burn somebody's car. You do not have the right to do even damage city property because that belongs to the people. Mm-hmm. You don't have the right to 
cause damage to people or property, period. That is not the right to assemble. That is not what the founding fathers had in mind. It seems like such a simple concept. It does. It's unfortunate that this is a topic of debate nowadays. I know. Again, kind of like last week when we were talking about child trafficking, I feel like we should all pretty much be on the same page when it comes to these issues. Well, and a lot of the flag burning stuff too, like that was a hot button topic. So some of these protesters are bringing their own flags and lighting them on fire, like symbolically. But where it became a problem is when they were ripping flags down from small towns that they were not from, or even big cities, they were ripping flags down from schools, from courthouses, from people's homes and lighting that on fire. Well, that belongs to somebody else. That mm -hmm. is somebody else's property. Yeah. So if you come to my house and you rip down a flag and you light it on fire, you're going to get punched in the I face. I wish you luck. Yeah. <laughs> and if you go to a, sm a small town America and you rip the gigantic flag, I mean, we have a massive flag flying over our town. Mm -hmm. If out of town people bust in and rip that flag down and lit it on fire, it would not go well for them. It'd be bad for their health. It would be ill-advised. <laughs> so that's what this song is about. There's a lot of truth to it. I don't see anything wrong with it at all. Let's I, talk about the racial component of it because yeah. this is something else that we are very commonly asked and it's always a little troubling or baffling. And I mean, mm -hmm. I guess I understand the reasoning behind it given the area that we live in, but is, do you, do you think that there is more, yeah, this is a good, good thing to talk about for uh, us to discuss. Do you think that there is more racism that exists within small towns as opposed to larger cities? Um, well, I think a lot of the policies in big cities are in fact racist. Extremely racist. So I don't, I see a lot of the policy in, in big cities as, as targeting races more. And then in a small town, I think in, in this town in particular, if you come here and you act like a punk, they're going to treat you like a punk. If you regardless come, of your race. Yep. Regardless of your race. And if you come here and you act if, if you're a good community member and you're a good person, they're going to treat you as a good community member and a good person regardless of your race. So we've never seen any problems. We have been asked many times since moving here because North Idaho for some, you know, back, back in the day, long time ago, had a reputation that has very sadly kind of followed it for being, you know. I don't know if it's sad or not because anybody who buys into the, uh, the, the lie perception the that this area is extremely racist is probably somebody who wouldn't thrive or do very well here. I'm speaking as a actual yeah. minority who lives here in North Idaho. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that I've never felt uh, so welcomed and um, been met with so much kindness. Mm -hmm. And it's not across the board. There are always going to be exceptions to it. But the same thing applied when we lived in a big city. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'd say it's more prevalent in the big city just because of numbers maybe. Um, but there were there were a lot of racist people and a lot of racist groups mm -hmm. in yeah. the area that we lived in. There were, there were a lot of racist groups who didn't realize that there were racist groups, um, but they were. If mm -hmm. you listened and pay attention and applied some logic to a lot of the things that were said or the policies that were uh, proposed, extremely, extremely racist. And mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of the people actually uttering these words or speaking upon these concepts realized exactly how racist they were. Right. Well, I remember... Nevaeh got really into Moana when it came out and she wanted to dress like Moana for Halloween. And I had this very um, redheaded Irish woman telling me how wrong that was. Because of cultural No, it wasn't Moana. It was Lilo. She wanted to be Lilo mm. from Lilo and Stitch. Cause that, wasn't that makes Lilo. more sense, timing yeah. wise. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute, Moana was after her. <laughs> it wasn't, it was one of the little Hawaiian Disney movies. So sure. Lilo, okay. Um, Dad from Hawaii. Yes. And I was told, cause she just saw me and I was looking for stuff for Lilo at the little kid store that I used to shop at all the time. And this was in Portland. Yeah. Okay. And so she was like, you know, that's, that's cultural appropriation and you can't, your daughter should not dress like that. And I'm like, you know, my daughter, <laughs> his father is from Hawaii. We love this movie. She thinks, you know, hula dancing, all that we took her there and she was hula dancing for the, <laughs> the tourists and everything. Everyone thought she was a little local girl and, um, she's a little hoppa girl, a little mixed girl. And, and she just looked at her, looked at me and went, your daughter can't dress like that. And it's like, hey, have you ever thought that maybe these Hawaiian people don't need you? Like, did they ask you to go out and police the the Lilos for Halloween? On their behalf. Yeah, on their behalf. Did they say, hey, we we don't want little girls looking up to our Disney characters and saying that those are cool. We like that. I want to dress like that. Um, did they ask for your help? Because <laughs> no. I always find that really insulting as well. 
incredibly. How about it's it's beautiful? How about mm -hmm. somebody is taking an interest in your culture yeah. and they're exploring it, they're learning about it, they are celebrating it. Yeah. If you're doing it in a demeaning way, right. sure, that can absolutely 100% be incredibly insulting and I would chalk it up as being uh, inappropriate. Right. But when somebody is literally going out of their way to take an interest and celebrate your culture, what's wrong with that? I right. think it's a beautiful thing. We and need we need more of that. I know. Yeah, I just I mean, you know, you put Pineapple on a pizza and call it Hawaiian. Okay, I've, I've got to draw the line somewhere, I, Melissa. Okay, Jeremy, I'm putting pineapple on a pizza is freaking good. Okay, I'm putting my fist down on this one. <laughs> I will eat those Hawaiian pizzas and I will call them Hawaiian pizzas. But and then you know they throw feta cheese on and olives on a pizza and they call it Greek. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's like, but people are literally saying that like pizzas are racist now. Like people how far are, are we taking get this? Outraged over the littlest, most irrelevant, insignificant right. things nowadays. Yeah, I'm Greek and I'm not going over to, to Greek row at every university as they're dressed in bed sheets, calling them togas, doing keg stands, going yeah. toga, toga. I'm not saying you are insulting my culture. But yet I was told when I was wearing a Grecian style dress, like one shoulder kind of little dress thing that was white, that I was... Uh, you know, I shouldn't dress like that because that's someone else's culture. Even though it was my culture, she right. just wasn't aware. And I just thought that was so ridiculous. And I'm like, hey, listen, as a Greek, I don't need you to be offended for us. Yeah. That's, it's fine. Yeah. How about leave it alone? Yeah. It's not. Simple as that. Where no offense is meant, no offense should be taken. And I'm, I'm getting a little tired of all these offended people for every little thing. Because be offended. If you start, it's okay to be offended. Sure. But don't project that on other people. I'm all for individual liberties. Mm -hmm. And you are not to infringe upon my individual liberties. And the same thing applies for me when it comes to you. Like I said, I can disagree with somebody burning the flag, but I fully support your right to do it. Because part of freedom, if you want to live in a free society, is allowing for somebody with the opposite uh, views or opinions of you to be able to argue for those viewpoints and... But you better have purchased that flag and not sure. stolen yeah. it. Sure, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you cannot cross the line of actually breaking the law. But again, yeah. it's, um, you know, if you want to live in a free society, it is an imperfect world and mm -hmm. you have to allow for these imperfect incidents to, um, right. you, you have to allow for it. This right. just simple as that. It might be very uncomfortable. It might be hard to stomach. It might be hard to, to, to swallow, but it's, it's important for the upholding of our free society. So what we've seen in my hometown and in the city that we moved from was basically taking this to the extreme of also allowing them to damage other people's property in the name of free speech and the right to assemble. Negative. You will not see that in small towns, and that is what this song is about. If you come and you damage our property and you wreck our livelihood and you smash in the windows of our shops and you think that you're going to smash in a gift shop window and take everything that's inside or mug an old lady, like it literally says, like, steal an old lady's car at a red light. If you put a gun to a the window of someone's car and you rip them out of their vehicle, you don't have the right to do that. And you're not going to get very far in a town like we live in. Mm -hmm. And I think you do see a lot less violent crime in small towns too, because of recognition. So here, if you are a sex offender or something, they put you on the community site with your picture and they make it difficult or very uncomfortable to live here because if you commit a crime that is deemed dangerous or they believe the community should know about it, they put your picture up. And it's not about uh, ridiculing or chastising any individual. However, yeah, it's something it's that uh, yeah, you, you should have knowledge of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the community should be aware of who it could possibly victimize your family. I agree. Can we go back to a second for the, to the uh, racial component? Because I thought it was mm -hmm. so funny with regard to the Jason Aldean song right. that there were so many... Uh, black African-American uh, folks who actually reviewed the video, listened to the song and were like, what is the problem? Yeah, they were almost taken yeah. back. Yeah, so I've been, we've been watching a lot of different online personalities and a lot of uh, people from both sides of the aisle, all different walks of life, watching this music video that had never listened to country music and they go into it like, okay, I want to see why this is racist. And then the song ends and they're like, I don't What's get the problem? What's, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> so... I didn't, there's just nothing racist in the song. There was nothing racist in the clips from the news that were used. And so I think that all they were saying was, don't think you're going to come to a small country town and commit crimes. Now, if you think that that's racist, you have to, why do you think that coming to a town and committing crimes and smashing in windows and lighting things on fire is a race thing? Like if yeah. you, if you say, 
that's black people's behavior, then you're the one being racist. Nobody, nobody most, here cares if you are black, if yeah. you are Latino, if you are Asian, if you are white. If yeah. you're doing these types of acts, if you're committing crimes and violence against people or, or property, yeah. you're going to be met with resistance. Most of the Antifa crime was done by Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And most of the footage shown in the music video were Caucasian offenders. And, which I found so funny because the people who are trying to uh, form this narrative around the song are once again being inherently racist without yes. their even realizing it by saying oh he this is racist against black americans yeah that is a massive massive assumption there is yeah. nothing within the the music video or the song that would allude to that whatsoever yeah. so for you to make that assumption about about him and and that this is what he's actually referring to as a is a dog whistle message is incredibly racist it on is. your part. Why is it that if, if he's referring to criminals that you're assuming automatically that it, they, that he's talking about black Americans? Right. It's not at all the case. You are the one who is perpetuating this racial divide within our country. You're doing nothing to unify people whatsoever. You literally took it upon yourself to inject and insert your, your uh, racial perspective into this music video when it had absolutely nothing to do with anything right so okay so what they what one person that i saw was saying that it was the location of the music video that made mm. it racist as well as so it was filmed in a courthouse in tennessee in front of it yeah in yes. front of one only some of it was filmed right. at this really beautiful courthouse in tennessee which happened to be the location of it was like a 96-year-old lynching of an 18-year-old black American. A uh, black American yes. man that was accused of sexually assaulting a young girl. Right. So there was a mob lynching done there and so they were saying that's why he picked the location. But then the actual recording producers that arranged it all were like actually Jason Aldean did not pick the location we picked the location and this location is used in many movies and many music videos many. it was used for an episode or scenes within an episode of Hannah Montana <laughs> a children's show there have been numerous shows that have used the building because it is a beautiful building yeah. and just so happens that it's also a courthouse that is located down south so this isn't a story or situation no. from that era that is unique to that building so yeah. I don't think there was any ill intent with using it as the backdrop for this musical performance and if, again, if we're going to apply it to this one situation, we better logically apply it across the board. Right. So is Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus, is she also racist? I don't think so. Neither do I, <laughs> which is why it's a ridiculous argument. Yeah. I also don't think Miley Cyrus picks the location for a lot of her stuff. Sure I think people doesn't. are giving these, I think people are giving these, um, he also didn't write the song. So they're almost giving them him too much credit. Like so, you think that he sat there and went, okay, almost a hundred years ago, this was the location of this one horrible event that, you know, did actually very unfortunately take place throughout the South. Um, I'm going to pick that location just to poke and, and hope people realize. I, don't, I just don't think there is that ill intent. I agree. And so given all of that, why do you think it is, it is that this song and this music video are being targeted by an opposition who are trying to come up? with a narrative to spread. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there is an attempt to discredit people that do live in small towns in middle America and in these farm communities. There is a, a narrative spread that they are racist. And I, I, I have to say we, because you know we live here now. So narrow-minded, racist, uneducated, country bumpkins. I mean, you hear all this stuff, Very bug dismissive. eaters. Like there's all these... Yeah, rednecks. Yep. There's all these derogatory terms used towards ranching communities, farm communities, you know, the people that feed you and work hard. Mm -hmm. And when you go into these small communities and you walk into a diner, everyone doesn't turn and stare at you like they show on TV, like, and then like spit tobacco out of the side of their mouth. It's friendly. It's warm. It's good family people. Mm -hmm. What's your name? Where are you from? Welcome. Hope you enjoy your stay. Values. I mean, when we came and visited, we got handshakes, pats on the shoulder. And I mean, yeah, you were, you were not a white man. Our, our children are not white children. Never came up. Never came up. No. Yeah. And so we'll get asked by people, how has it been? Like we were considering moving there, but we're really worried. You're, talk, you're talking about outsiders who reach out yep. to us and ask these questions. So again, I, I point out that it's never come up because it came up all the time when we lived in Portland. 
-hmm. You are a minority. You are a person of color. You should feel a certain way automatically because of it. And that was never the case for me. Abandon all reasoning, abandon all logic and adopt this narrative, adopt, adopt this political viewpoint. Absolutely not. And like I said, it never comes up here. Race has never once been an issue for our family or myself as an individual, not yeah. once. Yeah. And we do, we don't have as diverse as a population as you will find in Seattle, but there is diversity still in North Idaho mm -hmm. and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Like everybody is just a member of the community. We say nobody as a generalization. Right. There, there may be exceptions to that, but there are so few and far between. But you're not going to see it publicly done. And if somebody were to speak up and say something racist in the community in front of other people, that is going to be the person that's ridiculed yeah. by the community. Yep. And it so. came up, like I said, it came up all the time. And I mean, in, in a, just a, a small talk passing discussion, race would, yeah. would be thrown into the conversation on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, when we lived in the city and there was an, always an expectation that came along with that, which again is inherently yeah. racist. So you, sh you should live to be offended and, and look for that in things. Yeah. So I think that this all corresponds with kind of what we spoke about last week with the uh, child sex trafficking narrative that's sprung up all of a sudden in that I think there is an uprising of evil and it's, a, it's not, and not divide. to get and divide. Yeah. And um, lines that want to be drawn and people who want to divide people and keep them lumped into groups based on a certain criteria. I think it's evil. I think all of it is evil. I think people are going out of the way to minimize what a riot is by calling it a uprising or calling it a protest and saying that, uh, no, it was mostly peaceful when it wasn't, it was just flat out violence. It's the same way that they're now trying to come out with acronyms, excusing, uh, acts of pedophilia or it, it, it all, it's one and the same in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and I think when people stand up and say no to it, it can put an end to it, but people are afraid to, or they think, no, we're so far gone. There's nothing you can really do about it. So there's a lot of complacent people that just don't want to rile up. They don't want to be the one to say, no, I'm yep. not okay with this. Because we also live in a time of uh, self censorship based on outside forces and outside pressures, right? Fear of being canceled. There are going to be a number of people who listen to what it is that we've been saying over the last 45 minutes here who, who go, you're not allowed to say that. I'm allowed to say whatever it is that's on my mind. You can become offended all you want. I'm not going to bite my tongue. I am not going to self-censor. I'm not going to self-police. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's what we end up doing out of fear. A lot of it's out of fear of being canceled, fear of losing your livelihood is, yeah, you self-censor to the point that you kind of lose who you are and what your true feelings are. And I don't know. I just, it's funny because like growing up in the eighties in Seattle, it's just not something that we ever thought about. I had friends that were all different. I mean, Asian, Hispanic, black, Greek, mm -hmm. white. And did anyone think, Filipino, did like, anyone acknowledge those differences in a, in a negative light? No, so. I don't think that most kids do, you know? And I think that's something that we, we develop as we get older, maybe because you're told to. And so that's why I don't really like it being told in the schools that like mm -hmm. you should be offended if you're this color yes. or this person is against you or this, um, this society is against you. Small towns are against you. Um, don't tell children that because if you just look at the behavior of children, they don't, they're, they're not, you're not born that way. That's something that, that is taught. We shouldn't take our differences and use them as a means of getting riled up or offended. We should right. acknowledge those and we should celebrate the differences mm -hmm. that we all have, uh, in, in, you know, in a class, in a society, what have you, if there are disparities that are unfair, fine, sure. We can, we can pinpoint those and address them. But the things that are chalked up as being disparities nowadays are not. Yeah, and not only that, kind of like you pointed out, when you are telling, uh, young children who are of a racial minority that they should be upset based on uh, historical arguments that uh, they, sh they should be upset at their Caucasian counterparts, you're doing no good. That is an absolutely evil, despicable thing to try to instill within a young child at an early age. How mm -hmm. dare these people say these types of things to children, especially when they are placed in a position of authority within a classroom or a school, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. It is disgusting. Yeah. I hate it and it's why I refuse to bite my tongue. Yeah, well, and I think it's really unfair it's, it's unfair to tell a child that they're a victim because of the color of their skin. And right. it's unfair to tell a child that they are a perpetrator because of the color of their skin. To insist upon it. Yeah. Based on something that happened hundreds of years ago and had absolutely zero to do with them. Yeah. Placing guilt even on like a Caucasian child 
for something that was done, you know, a long time ago that had nothing to do with them or their parents or their grandparents. It's disgusting. It is. It's, it's just so unfair. And so I don't like that. I, I don't see that as much in small areas. I don't think the community would really stand for it or put up for it. I, I mean, there's, they pay attention in a small town. People really pay attention, whether it's books in a library or something. There's just a big fight going on over one book right now. One book in our library that someone saw, and then there was a whole town meeting and a bunch of people showed up and they discussed the book and they came to a decision that they would take this book and they would put it in the adult section. You had to request it. So it's just in a community that's small, people pay attention to little things. And if they saw something that was just glaringly not okay, like if, if that agenda were being pushed in the elementary school, I think the community would speak up and would be listened to yeah. more so. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not well educated on that specific issue, so I don't want to touch it. However, yeah, I, I agree with you in just in general, there, there are so many things that are happening and we never ever intended for, for this uh, podcast or this discussion uh, to, to become political in any way, but it's reached a point now where I'm seeing things on a consistent basis and it's just gotten out of hand. We've, we've gone back to back weeks now with having to have these discussions about things that are just, it's, it's just so, so concerning to me that there are these glaring false narratives that are being pushed on people. And so many folks buy in based, they're so easily swayed based mm -hmm. on like such minimal information. It's like, we are, we are now living in a time where you are not um, encouraged to use critical thinking whatsoever. You are, you are told what it is you are to think based on, like I said, a lot of very specific criteria, whether that be race, your, uh, economic, uh, you know, just your, your place in the world, uh, when it comes to, to money, what, what have you, your, your class, however you want, you want to divide people rather than trying to bring people together, um, encourage some critical thinking and just unity. Right. It bums me out. Yeah, I think you see, you, I like the small town because the crime rate is lower. I mean, that's just, you can look at the FBI crime stats in major cities. You're going to be seeing upwards of four times the crime. Like Seattle is four times the crime as your average rural city. You, I'm, I, I used to be a cop and I would never feel safe just walking through Portland or downtown Seattle. There's no way. No, not There's no night. way I wouldn't have uh, tools on my person to protect myself and my family. There's yeah. no way. And if you think you are safe... Have at it. That's that's your own personal decision to make. But I'm I'm watch telling you, you're probably coming from night. a very very naive perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, watch the news and you see innocent people being attacked, and you just I guess you don't see that here. Not at all. There are far less people, but this is a per capita. These are per capita rates. Yes. It's not like oh well, you have lower crime because you have less people. No, this is percentage wise. This yep. is per hundred thousand people, which is how they do it. Yep. And I just think a lot of it is accountability. I think a lot of it is pride in where people live mm -hmm. and you're just not going to get away with it. If you try, if you tried to walk into Safeway here and pull a gun and think you're going to rob the area. <laughs> it's not you keep using words that are going to force me to make edits here. I'm in so the, sorry. In the, the podcast. I'm edit. sorry. It's fine. Good discussion. I'm glad we, we are comfortable with taking on these issues because it's something that we, we discuss a lot here yeah. in our household. Um, and hopefully the people tuning in are just, uh, receptive and open and uh, respectful of the fact that we are wanting to come on here to have these discussions because I think it's so important. Yeah. And I mean, so I think the consensus for us is that this song is not promoting violence. Our radio station is actually still playing it. So I didn't even know this was a, uh, I just heard it like two or three days ago and I didn't know this was even an issue till I started seeing it yeah, coming across. Same. I believe online. it's the number one song. So I think most people would uh, agree with that sentiment and it's, um, and before forming an opinion, go listen to the song and read the lyrics. Don't just listen to what other people, don't listen to what we're saying. Don't listen to what yeah. the opposition saying. Don't listen to us. Yeah. Don't, don't take our word for it. Go seek it out for yourself right. and decide for yourself, but apply some critical thinking and be open-minded and uh, try not to take a biased approach. Right. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, okay. Next week, let's try not to do something so hyper-political. Yeah. In fact, is that, is next week where we are bringing in our first guest? We are bringing in our first guest. Yeah. Not our, political at all. <laughs> our first uh, outside guest will be coming in. We are really, really excited about it. Yep. Um, hopefully you guys will be as well. We have a very, very interesting person coming in here. So we'll do some prep work for that. I can't wait to have that conversation and learn a little more about her and, uh, yeah, I think that's all we have for today. All right. Yeah. Anything else from you? No, I don't think so. I'm excited for next week. So am I. Okay. So we want to thank you guys once again for tuning in. This is episode number what? Five? Yeah. Five weeks. Wow. It's going by quick. Um, thank you for being here. 
We really, really appreciate it. We'll be back next Wednesday and then we will have a good simple living video out on Saturday. Yep. So till then we will see you guys uh, in the coming week. Bye.